Today in criminal law, we look at the concept of ambiguity. Now, last time we looked at vagueness. Vagueness describes the very narrow situation where a statute, through its lack of linguistic clarity, fails to provide adequate notice to a reasonable person so that they can comport their behavior and raises concern of arbitrary and discriminatory enforcement. And that very limited case where a statute meets all those criteria, it is held unconstitutionally vague under the due process clauses of the U.S. Constitution. Today, we look at the more ordinary situation, uh, at least uh, where statutes aren't clear enough that we can say for sure uh, what they mean is applied to specific facts. But instead, there's some ambiguity, but not enough ambiguity or not enough other concerns for the statute to be deemed unconstitutional. So how do we assess ambiguity? Well, it turns out some statutes might look clear and plain in their meaning uh, for a large swath of their core cases that fit underneath them. But then when applied to certain boundary fact patterns, uh, there is ambiguity that needs to be resolved uh, by the courts. Uh, this begins at the trial court level, where the trial court will uh, often give a jury instruction as to the meaning of a particular clause or phrase. This is created from uh, the two parties uh, arguing over what the jury instruction should be and or a model jury instruction uh, in place or any of instruction of the judge's own creation that meets the, the specifications of the law. Uh, but then when we look at the appellate court opinions, they're reviewing uh, how the statute was interpreted, how the jury was instructed, and whether or not um, it was resolved in a satisfactory manner. So we're going to look at several cases that fit under this umbrella of ambiguity, each raising slightly different concerns. And one of the key ideas here is that statutes uh, require a variety of tools to interpret. Although it's nice to think that statutes define themselves or that plain meaning is something we can merely take for granted, the reality is far more complicated. And the cases today illustrate that. They illustrate that sometimes things that seem very clear to the drafters or the legislatures who are voting in favor of a law uh, just don't maintain that clarity either through time, through specific facts, or just because they didn't anticipate uh, the way the statute would be applied or interpreted by others. And this is a common uh, pattern in criminal law. criminal law. Criminal law statutes are often drafted without a deep debate or broad concern about their application, and so things are left to the courts to resolve. And so we're going to look at a few cases that try to illustrate this this concept of ambiguity, which is very ordinary. It doesn't raise any constitutional objections, but it's something you need to confront, and we need to learn the tools that will help you manage the ambiguity in a way that fairly and consistently can apply a statute. So to that end, let's jump into our first case, uh, United States versus DeRay. Now, this case um, is unusual in a couple regards. One is uh, it has very specific language about quantity, right? That is not something that we see, particularly outside of drug crimes. And this is something you would expect to not be ambiguous, right? Three, right? Three or more seems very clear. But as we'll talk about, even with that clear language that the Congress thought it was enacting, uh, it doesn't present um, an application that is consistent because of the different types of media that exist. But the second thing is this case also involves the rule of lenity. The rule of lenity is essentially tie goes to the defendant. Now that's a simplification, but it's pretty close to encapsulating the rule. But the truth is the rule of lenity is an argument raised by defendants all across the country all the time whenever they have an argument that the statute should be interpreted in their favor. And prosecutors will push back against it. And prosecutors usually win overwhelmingly. And so this is one of the rare cases, not quite a unicorn, but quite rare cases where the rule of validity uh, wins the day for the defendant. And notably, it's a split decision here. So I, I at least want to caution you from reading too much into this and thinking the rule of validity is the magic bullet uh, to resolve ambiguous cases, because in fact, it is a frequently raised but often lost argument. And the number of times it's won are, are 
Very few, very few. And as I mentioned in one of the discussion questions afterwards, Justice Scalia was one of the justices, few justices in modern history that is, has shown a concern for the rule of lenity, although Justice Ginsburg mentioned it in an opinion not too long ago. Uh, and so its future, at least, is, is a little in doubt in terms of Supreme Court law, but lower courts are free to apply it as they want. And the idea here is if statutes are so ambiguous that multiple interpretations are viable, the rule of lenity should decide in favor of the defendant. Okay, so what are our facts of DeRay? Well, we have uh, possession of child pornography. Uh, in this case, we have 13 unbound pictures of minors, um, but they're taken from larger media. In other words, these were not just individual images uh, that were taken and produced by our defendant. And this lack of binding raises a problem because the statute at issue here requires three or more books, magazines, periodicals, films, videotapes, or other matter. And you should, you know, and I recognize even without the facts of these cases, thick accounting of three in across all those medias itself is a little crazy, right? Three films include far more images than say three still photos or three magazines and books. These are all quantity uh, that that of of media that you know have very different effects and very different number of images. And of course, other matter, this residual clause, like we talked about last time, you know this this could include a, a, an even bigger range that we're not necessarily thinking of in the digital age. And so there is this seeming problem that the court's addressing uh, beyond the, the ambiguity, which is, doesn't it seem strange that a defendant, if they kept a magazine of child pornography images together, right, if they had kept them bound, that would count as one. But then, according to the prosecution, arguably, uh, if each page was separated or cut out or removed, then the number of media increases, right? Even if they didn't even keep the rest of the magazine, even if they only used half of it. And so this problem of counting, you know, very clear language applied to different media is a problem, right? This is a real problem. Similarly, and, and this is something I've heard prosecutors actually try in a uh, few districts across the country, so you could imagine a film strip, right, which is just, uh, you know, when you look at it, it's just a series of images. And so, uh, prosecutors have tried to argue that each image in a film strip itself is an image and should count as other matter, and therefore you easily exceed three in any film. Um, and of course, there's other statutes that do similar counts here with uh, child pornography. And even the court mentions this statute has since been amended. So we're just looking at it from an, an illustration standpoint because the depth of uh, meaning or depth of investigation as to the meaning of the statute is um, pretty high here. The court is very focused on going through a lot of different possibilities, looking at different methods and techniques, and then reaching outcomes. So it's it's a good example to follow, um, even if the statute itself is no longer active, and even if you might disagree with the reasoning of the majority, because they do set out a very systemized process uh, that um, gives fair treatment, I think, to both sides of the argument. Okay, so what does the court look at first in deciding the issue? Well, they try to see plain meaning, right? And as they recognize, plain meaning here, it doesn't really give us any um, obvious solution. And, and generally, courts start here, right? They start with the text. They start with, um, you know, the words defined through either prior court cases and sometimes dictionaries. Dictionaries can be a little controversial with some language, but it's it's not a bad source when we're dealing with very um, normal everyday use language like numbers or in this case contain, right? Because the contain is is a big part of what they're they're looking at there. And and the court, you know, notices that this contain, the idea of binding and holding, um, and how you count the thirteen unbound images, um, there's arguments both ways, right? And it's based on prior case law, on Webster's third new Ash international, and so forth. And so um, the the court you know, is is torn, and as was the district court, about which 
uh, made sense from the, the statute uh, when the statute was drafted, which one Congress intended, uh, because contain can mean different things in this context. And then their other matter phrase, which the court also considers very important, they refer to the meaning as elusive, um, because if you're counting these as other matter, right? In other words, each image itself is a form of other matter, versus you could count it as one magazine that's unbound, right? You know, which category it falls in changes your count, and other matter itself is not a term of art. It's not a phrase that gives obvious meaning. So the court, looking at both contains and matter, decides that there's just not plain meaning here. So they resort to what we call the canons of construction. Now, the canons of construction are um, a, a long, long uh, list of doctrines, uh, some of which are in contradiction with each other. Uh, many of which are not regularly used, that have evolved through common law traditions to give meaning uh, or uh, find uh, the best interpretation of a statute. Um, and in this case, uh, the court focuses on a few canons of construction. And, and this is where the course of criminal law only gives you a small um, piece of the statutory interpretation puzzle. There are many other canons of construction, some of which only arise in certain contexts. But at this point, it's important for you to have the basics, many of the basic tools. So the first canon the court looks at is this a list and associated terms. Now, I've already touched on this last time with the residual clause, and we're going to look at it two cases today, right? So we have it in this one and then the McBoyle case. Both of those revolve around lists and how you interpret these catch-all residual clauses at the end. And as the court notes, there's a couple canons that tell us about how to interpret lists, and as a result, there's not any clear indication of how matter that last clause should be interpreted here. The second method is statutory structure. And I think this is an important one when there's strong evidence that the structure matters, but it's rarely um, applicable, especially in criminal law, because criminal law statutes tend to be smaller and shorter. It's just uh, the nature of the beast. Whereas, say, the, the Affordable Care Act, which was subject to uh, challenges based on its language and its applicability, particularly for state exchanges, statutory structure was enormously important in how the court interpreted that law because there was so many different pieces and they were meant to form a coherent whole. So if interpreting one clause in isolation could lead you astray, and this was a big part of one of the the cases that was litigated all the way to the Supreme Court uh, was about this larger structure and context. But in criminal law, we're generally dealing with uh, individual crimes defined, you know, just within a few sentences at most. And so the court here does look at the broader law here, the Protection of Children Against Sexual Exploitation Act, which was one of Congress's many efforts uh, to criminalize child pornography. Many of them failed because the statutes were overbroad and struck down on First Amendment grounds. And so there are a few other um, crimes here. There are a few other instances where the language might help, but the court doesn't find much. And so this structural analysis, although you know, it could be powerful if there was strong evidence that matter meant something else, some, you know, one of the related provisions or contains meant something quite clear in another provision, but none of that is, is, is really applicable here. Uh, the third, and this is what I want to caution you about, is the concept of statutory amendment. So um, whether Congress amends or doesn't amend a statute can be the basis for inference about its meaning. So since this statute has been subsequently amended, we might think that gives us some information about what they were changing and what they were trying to do. But I, as I said, I want to caution you there because... Why Congress changes it is often hard to pin down for the reason it's often hard to pin down what any legislature is doing. You, you know, you have um, all the different members of the House of Representatives, all the different senators. Only one or two may speak at all, and it's unclear. Uh, it's also dangerous uh, to infer based on, say, inaction, right? You know, if they don't amend one thing but amend another, do they really mean to leave that one thing in place? So, yeah, again, the court here it has some something to look at because of the amending process of this statute. But uh, they don't see anything that tells us about the phrase other matter. So nothing there. Now, the fourth one is is one that you see in lots of cases, but it's often hard to get agreement between judges about its scope, uh, which is avoiding absurdity, right? So let's pick an easy example of what we call a Scrivener's era. 
error uh, if a law left out the word not, right? So it actually read in a way that was the exact opposite of what everyone thought it was supposed to do. You could interpret it the as though the not were there, right? Because you would say that's the way to avoid the absurdity of the statute, right? To If it meant to criminalize murder and it actually allowed it or something uh, crazy like that. But the scope of this absurdity exception is a little tricky because what one person thinks is absurd, another person might characterize as a policy disagreement, um, that it's not really absurd, it's just a different outcome. Uh, and there are certain justices and judges throughout history that have found absurdity far um, more obvious than others, right? Some are saying, hey, it's up to the legislature to fix it. I'm not going to say it's absurd unless it's extremely um, uh, irrational and contrary to all uh, basic principles. And others are more willing to work out the kinks in, in legislation that they see as somewhat uh, flawed. Um, and so the absurdity here is you know, arguable because of the weird um, dynamic that three books count the same as three magazines count the same as three images. But that actually seems like what Congress was going for. I mean, even among the books and magazines, periodicals, films, you're already dealing with a lot of different media. So it would be difficult to say that this absurdity uh, that, that might exist in it is anything other than what Congress intended. So the avoiding absurdity analysis they dispose of within uh, a paragraph. And so it's not very applicable in this case, but it is a common argument made. Okay, so with all that um, out of the way, uh, you know, we, we've tried looking at the text. Legislative history is uh, important to the large majority of uh, judges, um, but there are exceptions. Justice Scalia perhaps being the most prominent critic of legislative history use in interpreting statutes. In fact, he would regularly create um, uh, strange splits in Supreme Court opinions where he would say, I join all of the majority opinion parts one, two, three, four, and except part C footnote seven. And that would be his you know, concurrence. And it'd be like, well, why? Well, it's because footnote seven would be legislative history. He refused to join legislative history ever as the basis for uh, interpreting statute. His view, though, is a minority view. If he hadn't been placed as a prominent Supreme Court justice or even a Supreme Court justice at all, uh, you probably wouldn't know as much about the criticism of legislative history. But there are some judges out there who follow his his lead in this area. So what, what is the problem with legislative history? It seems like we should we should care about what the legislature or was intending, right? We should try to figure out what it was was aiming for, at least if there's evidence of it, so that we can interpret it text. Well, this gets back to the problem I, I was mentioning about amendments, right? It's it's more it's just as true here. It's difficult to infer the will, the goals of a legislature that is uh, often, you know, very diverse. And legislative history is only capturing a small window into that. It's who decides to speak, say, at a, at a hearing, uh, who decides to make a statement before the vote. Um, that's not necessarily reflective of what the law was meant to accomplish. Some cases, particularly if it ends up being an, an opponent to the law, they might you know, make the law sound much worse than everyone else is interpreted to be. And so the legislative history there can be misleading. With that being said, the reason most judges rely on it and find it to be um, helpful is many times there are uh, uh, good records that show exactly what the problem a legislature was focused on, exactly how they meant to resolve it, and why they chose the language they did. Now, that's the ideal case. You know, it doesn't happen all the time. In most of our cases in criminal law, we get less legislative history than we'd like. But it doesn't make sense to most judges to overlook good evidence of meaning if it's there, simply uh, on principle. And so legislative history is always going to be part of this picture. And you can see the court here spends a, a good amount of time trying to, you know, go through what um, there was at the congressional level to indicate um, intent here. But they don't find anything, right? There's, there's just the history here is very thin. And so they just can't resolve the ambiguity. And so given that there are two possible interpretations here, the, the one proffered by the defense and the one by the government, the court does something that is extremely rare. And they say the rule of lenity applies. It's the doctrine of last resort, but it they think it matters here. And so 
uh, the defendant's conviction is overturned. Um, so this outcome does draw a dissent from Judge Katzman, who's not, you know, just any old judge. He's actually written a whole book on statutory interpretation. Uh, but notably, even when he, he disagrees with Jordy, he's not screaming and yelling that they were crazy, that they completely misunderstood the process. But he does think, I think, as maybe the majority of judges would in this instance, that the, the rule of lenity is not the way to resolve this case, right? Just because all the tools you had didn't provide you a clear answer, it's still the job of judges in most instances to decide which is the best. And the rule of validity should only be applied in very, very, very narrow situations. And he thinks that the words contain and other matter, we they got enough meaning uh, to decide uh, the way the case should come out. And after all, it was presented to the jury in a seemingly fair way. Uh, and so uh, he disagrees and would um, allow the conviction to stand. And I think, as I said, that's probably the majority view of the issue. Um, it's hard to say in a specific fact pattern, but the rule of validity so rarely wins. And it's not like these words are unheard of or inherently confusing. It just happens that the application to this fact pattern illustrated the oddities of the law that Congress drafted. Um, it might also be, and this is a more cynical uh, view of the majority, that they weren't wor worried about the rule of lenity applying here um, because the statute had already been changed. Uh, and so this wouldn't have effects on lots of other cases where defendants would all say, oh yeah, we, I, it, it could go either way. You got to invoke the, invoke the rule of lenity and our favor. And so now that the statute is off the books and there's a new uh, set of phrases and, and new words to uh, interpret, it's not as big a deal to let this one defendant get a break from the statute. So they don't trigger the higher culpability of having three or more of these various media. Okay, so that's how we generally interpret statutes, right? We, we use the text, we look at canons of construction, we look at legislative history. But now we take a trip back in time to an older case. Uh, and, and here um, we see, you know, the very famous Justice Holmes uh, writing a very short opinion, at least by modern standards, not as unusual back then, interpreting a statute that um, seems pretty straightforward, but it has that same problem we're seeing for the third time here, the residual clause, right? So we saw it in Johnson, the Armed Career Criminal Act. There it was unconstitutionally vague. We just saw it in a durée where uh, the rule of lenity helped resolve uh, the ambiguity uh, in the defendant's favor. And here uh, we see an instance where I think from our modern perspective, Justice Holmes is interpreting this statute in what seems to be an unusual way. Uh, and this is one of the reasons I like this case, even though it's older, because generally I like to teach modern cases reflecting modern law. But when it comes to interpreting statutes, sometimes it's helpful to step outside of your normal framework, right? To step outside of the things you take for granted and look at something anew. And so going back in time is a way to do that. And so with McBoyle, we have to think what it would be like to be a justice in 1931, looking at a law that is focused on vehicle theft and so we have to think about what a vehicle means in that time, particularly in the context of race. So, of course, the, the facts are really easy in this case. They're, they're described, you know, in just a sentence. Defendant stole an airplane. That's it, right? You know, they cross state lines, and that's what triggers the fate, federal jurisdiction here. And so the question is, is that a crime under the National Motor Vehicle Theft Act? And so the text of the act, which is where we have to start in, in almost all of our criminal law cases, but particularly so when we're interpreting the statute, and so Section 2 of the Act says uh, that the term motor vehicle shall include an automobile, automobile truck, which is a phrase you probably don't hear anymore, automobile wagon, motorcycle, or any other self-propelled vehicle not designed for running on rails. So here's a you know, airplane, definitely not an automobile, definitely not an automobile truck, not an automobile wagon, not a motorcycle. So does it fit in a residual clause? Well, again, I, as I said, to your modern sensibilities, you would just look at that phrase and you'd say, any self-propelled vehicle, well, yeah, that's, that's a plane, right? Okay, yeah. Not designed to run on rails. Well, yeah, planes don't run on rails, so this seems like airplane theft definitely applies. But we know Justice Holmes comes out the other way and says it doesn't. And so how does he reach that result? Well, you don't see nearly the elaborate process set out in DeRay, 
right? So you don't see this broken down here, are the steps, plain text. But a lot of the, the same intuitions and processes are uh, implicit, I think, in Justice Holmes' process here. Uh, notably, the first method of canon, or the first canon of construction used in DeRay, lists and associated items, is a big part of this. And the way that Justice Holmes approaches this, and this is a unanimous opinion as well, so there's not even a controversy among the justices about how this should be interpreted, is to look for a common thread among the items in the list and to focus on the time at when the statute was enacted in 1919. And the common thread, according to Justice uh, Holmes, is that they're all land-based vehicles, right? Automobile, automobile truck, automobile wagon, motorcycle. And so, yeah, it's, it, the, the residual clause is excluding um, uh, trains because there are specific laws dealing with trains uh, during this time, and they operate in a different way. Even though train theft is possible, it's far trickier because of the rails uh, problem. And so to him, it doesn't seem obvious that a plane should fit within this, right? It doesn't have that common thread. And Justice Holmes points out that 1919 airplanes were well known, right? The Wright brothers had long since uh, engaged in their famous Kitty Hawk flight. Uh, planes were also being developed in other nations. And so it's not as though Congress couldn't have mentioned them specifically. And so the lack of mention, he thinks, is indicative that it wasn't meant to be included. Um, this, though, does seem a little strange, right? You know, it's like, well, he's inferring a lot from that congressional failure to mention airplanes, or maybe, you know, too much, or just, you know, something that we should be worried about. Because it might be that they thought it was obvious included in any self-propelled vehicle not run on rails, right? The the fact that they, they included a residual clause could mean a couple different things. One is it could mean they wanted to include everything else that they didn't list at the beginning of their list. Or it could be, as Justice Holmes says, that they, they were really focused on land vehicles and they just wanted to make sure they had all land vehicles covered. And so automobile wagon, automobile truck, automobile motorcycle, well, maybe maybe there's something else out there, right? Maybe we still want to make sure covered wagons, well, although that's not self-propelled, I guess. Uh, but yeah, there has to be something there. And this is one of the criticisms, I think, of the McBoyle opinion, although I think, you know, at the time it, it made a lot more sense is one thing we have to make sure we do when we look at residual clauses is that we have to make sure they at least contain one instance, right? It wouldn't be right to just read it out of the statute because that would abrogate Congress's goals with a statute, right? If they had said automobile, automobile truck, automobile wagon, or motorcycle, that would be a reasonable statute. The fact that they included the clause means we should think there's at least one other thing there. Now, the difficulty with this one is they may have just wanted to um, be inclusive of innovation, right? That going forward, there could be all sorts of new categories of vehicles. Um, and those vehicles we want to uh, recognize. Um, it's also unclear if things like a three-wheel uh, motorcycle count as a motorcycle or they become a tricycle. And so they might have just, out of the abundance of caution, wanted to have that clause there at the end. But it is important, and I think one thing to, you know, at least uh, push back on Justice Holmes a little bit is, is he has limited that catch-all clause to a very small number of um, vehicles. And if he truly limited to zero, that would be a problem. But if he, as long as he lets one or two, that's fine. But this is a helpful case for taking you out of your comfort zone of just assuming any vehicle not running on rails would include an airplane. And think about, well, what did it mean when the law was drafted this way? What did it mean at this time? Of course, we have other airborne vehicles as well, uh, although many of them are, are not. It's unclear what self-propelled means in the context of, say, a hot air balloon. Um, but that was a means of locomotion at some times. Horse-drawn vehicles, as I already mentioned, were another category. And then we have waterborne vehicles, right, which don't even really get much of a mention at all here. Boats uh, and ships and so forth. And so, yeah, it could be that this is exactly what Congress was going for and the interpretation is entirely sound. But you notice there's not really an investigation of... of debate that Congress had, the legislative history, it's a simpler approach. And so, yeah, this is a, a situation where, again, the residual clause presents a problem, but Justice Holmes, for unanimous court, breaches a result that, you know, seemed to make sense at the time, and the other justices agreed. Okay, so now we move to our last case.
Ohio versus Fagan. Now, this does push us right into the modern era, and it puts us in a very conventional state law, right? So here we're looking at, you know, not a, a very not as in DeRay, which was a recently enacted set of crimes, child pornography, where Congress had amended things several times, and in fact, even amended it after um, the case at issue. That was, you know, a, a one situation. Then McBoyle's a dated statute to take us out of our comfort zone. This is more of a traditional crime, but it's a modern application because we have lots of statutes that, you know, deal with theft of various kinds. And they've been changed somewhat over the years, but a basic robbery functions pretty similarly, or at least it's framed similarly as it was. So the difference between a robbery and a theft is usually uh, f some type of force. I, I say usually, but it's really always. It's just what we mean by force, right? Force can include what we call constructive force, which is the threat of force. So if somebody says, give me all your money or I'll shoot you, they don't actually have to shoot you for it to trigger uh, the robbery part of the statute. So the constructive use of force can be sufficient. Or um, force, like hitting somebody, pushing them over, hitting them with a weapon, these are all things that could count. And so from that standpoint, we might think this statute is not ambiguous at all. But the facts here create a boundary case, right? So we, I mentioned statutes can seem very, very clear and have plain meaning that's easily applied in their sort of core targeted conduct area. But once we get to the boundaries, once we get to the edges, we're going to eventually run into a case that's a little trickier. And here we have a, a question over whether or not our defendants uh, used, or at least the one who, who was the main actor here, used force. We are looking at an accomplice, but just leave that aside for now. We'll look at the wrinkles of accomplice liability later. Um, it is not a big concern that the accomplice, it's not a concern at all that the accomplice is the one being charged here. And so how do we assess whether or not the theft here used force? Well, it all depends on how you describe the facts and the language that's used with them. And this is what makes the case tricky. So the person who um, you know owned the restaurant and had uh, their money stolen, uh, William Gosserus, um, he uh, was walking out of his vehicle with a money bag in hand. And then as he moved towards his car, a person, in this case White, who isn't our defendant, but was the prime actor in this case, uh, yanked the money bag away from you. And so that's it. That's all the contact between them. And the question is, can the yanking process, can the yanking of the money bag constitute force? Well, it's maybe not what you were thinking of, right? It's not the gun or the threat of use of the gun. It's not uh, hitting them. But we could imagine that in some cases a Yankee to a money bag could cause serious injury, right? If it pulled somebody over, if they busted their head open, um, you know, it could even at a minimum just cause discomfort from yanking somebody's arm. Um, and here, uh, the court focuses on a few different facts, uh, ultimately finding that force was used here. And we might want to think through each of these facts and how much we should lend weight to it, if at all. So one of the things the court focuses on is the age of our victim, right? He's 70 years old. So the court seems to think that this level of yanking um, is sufficient is applied to a 70-year-old, but maybe it wouldn't against a very fit 30-year-old uh, or 20-year-old. I do want to note, and it is something the dissent points out, uh, that um, we don't know much about this 70-year-old, and there maybe we all have an image in our head of somebody who's frail and decrepit, but he could actually be in very good shape and very strong. Um, and so there is this implicit um, factual analysis here that I that, that the dissent says maybe maybe you shouldn't generalize here, and maybe we shouldn't have a sliding scale of force based upon the age of the victim. A second fact here is the testimony on the stand. Now, testimony is important, right? You know, that's those are that's what's going on as far as how we get a factual construction. Um, we don't have, you know, super detailed video evidence of everything that we can break down frame by frame and decide if things are forceful. We're having oral testimony of the event, and the oral testimony here, uh, in one case uh, by our victim refers to uh, the yanking as being forceful. Uh, so he forcefully behind him yanked his bag and started to run. 
and he said he felt White's arm go through his arm and his bag disappeared. And the court thinks that's important, right? So in other words, we've, we've looked at the language of the testimony, and then, you know, they now are, now that they have these facts, right, we have the, the nature of the testimony, the, the age of the victim, we still have to decide what force means. And, uh, you know, they, they, the court here, um, you know, doesn't do that much analysis here, right? You don't see, now I have omitted parts of the opinion, but the depth of, of meaning analysis certainly is less than DeRay. And perhaps it's because, as the dissent notes, there's a lot of other cases in this jurisdiction that have found seemingly um, uh, greater uses of force do not constitute force, right? In particular, this Furrow case, we see Weaver and Myatt. So these prior court opinions um, seem to create a mishmash hodgepodge of force meaning, right? You know, how we decide if something is forceful. Um, but the court does, you know, point to at least the, the statute gives us some definition of force. And that's where they say we should really focus on meaning. And to them, the meaning is plain. And un undoubtedly, it, when a statute defines a word, you got to give that absolutely as much weight as you can. The problem is, is does it really solve our problem? Because as the definition of force in the statute is violence, compulsion, or constraint physically exerted by any means upon or against a person or thing. Now, I mean, if you replace force with violence, was the pull violent? That would seem to be harder to, to establish. Compulsion? Constraint? Um, yeah, it's actually not clear that our definition offers much. And this is not uncommon, right? When you define a word, sometimes you just replace it with synonyms. Um, and so the definitions that the statutes offer might just be really analogous words, or they'll subsets, you know, something that's narrower. So violence might be less than force, but everything that's violent is forceful. And so the court, though, just thinks the testimony of the age, it's, it's apparent here that this is obvious what force means and the jurors convicted on that basis. And that seems absolutely fine. But I do think there's a lot to be said for the dissent here, that this language is not as clear cut, that it is ambiguous. And it's ambiguous not just because the, the uncertain physical condition of the defendant, which we may or may not want to count, but because relying on a defendant's testimony about forcefulness is potentially problematic in a scenario like this. Now, this doesn't mean the factual testimony of the defendants, or, I mean, of the victim is irrelevant. In fact, it's, it's very, very important. The question is, when that testimony seems just conclusory, and it just happens to use a word that both has legal meaning and lay meaning, we run into a problem. So what do I mean by that? Well, force can mean something in the, the lay environment, the, the normal civilian world of non-lawyers out there. Um, that And that meaning isn't always going to be the same as a refined, specific legal meaning. It should be close in instances like this. We wouldn't think the word force had, had deviated to something different in the legal world. But it might be that, you know, the, a person would use it more casually to include things that wouldn't fit the legal definition. And so when a person merely uses the word force, we shouldn't make it a magic word. Is though, okay, well, that's it. That resolves the case. There's enough evidence. We also, and the, the, even the dissent doesn't quite want to say this, but we also might worry about uh, witness coaching in this regard, right? If a prosecutor knew that there was a magic word that had to be said, it's very easy to them to, you know, communicate that witness in a way that's not um, unethical, or at least not obviously unethical, right? When they're trying to rehearse testimony and get a, a victim to explain what happened, they can merely say, well, the statute requires force, which is defined as violence, compulsion. So, you know, I just want you to be aware of that. And sure enough, the next time the victim rehearses, they say, well, he forcibly pulled it from me. And the prosecutor says, well, great job. That I think you've really articulate to the jury what they need to hear so they understand uh, the nature of the crime. And, you know, if that interaction happens, then the word forcefully isn't really um, uh, insightful or meaningful because it's just a product of uh, a magic word being triggered by a prosecutor's coaching. So the conclusory nature is worrisome. But that's not the extent of the, the victim's testimony. He does say something that's itself a little ambiguous, right? He felt White's arm go through his arm. Right. Does that mean it hit it? Does that mean he pulled sort of in this sort of gap? It, it's unclear.
And then, ultimately, I think the dissent is a little upset at sight that goes beyond the issue of ambiguity, but is related to it, which is now there's a mess of precedents out there, right? And any future court is now going to have one messier case to that mess. Now, this is um, an intermediate appellate court, so this is not the high court. And it's not the high court. I mean, it's the high court's job generally to resolve um, contradictory precedents. And it's it's a little more difficult for an intermediate court because they can't overturn some of these prior cases right? that, are, that were made by courts above them. And so they're kind of left with a mess here, right? They're left with cases that seem to be similar to this or even worse than this with different outcomes. And so how do we explain these as a coherent uh, uh, set of doctrine or law, right? And a very basic principle of our law is like cases should be treated alike. And the dissent here is concerned because of the ambiguity represented in the word force, uh, that in fact, like cases are not being treated alike. Uh, but you'll notice even the dissent doesn't think that, you know, this should be a situation where it's unconstitutionally vague. You know, even recognizing all these problems, they're just inclined to interpret it in a way that best re resolves the um, different cases that are already out there and harmonizes them. And it happens to be in favor of the defendant in this instance. Uh, but it's not a constitutional concern, right? It's not the rule of validity. It's just a very pragmatic analysis of how do we interpret prior cases in light of an ambiguous statute. And we see disagreement here. But all the judges agree it's their job to figure it out, right? There is no uh, separation of powers concern that this is the legislature's uh, issue. Now, the legislature defined things that offered terms here. There's no constitutional concern. Right? This is just the work of being a judge, and it just happens they reached different outcomes. So these are our three basic cases for ambiguity. We're going to spend a lot of time looking at the review exercises because those give us fresh eyes, opportunities to look at a film clip at a statute where you don't know the outcome. You don't know what the court decided, so you can't just decide, oh, I think the majority is right. Instead, you got to figure out for yourself. But I want you to follow the process that is illustrated in these three cases and um, to be creative in your thinking about different meanings of the statutes, what they could include if you were to interpret them broadly, and then what they might exclude if you interpret them very narrowly. So that's it for our discussion of ambiguity. Uh, after uh, this section, we'll move on to the very important act requirements topic.